This video spoils all chapters of Faith, the Unholy Trinity. This video also discusses violence, homophobia, the denial of reproductive rights, and the satanic panic. This video has not been approved by the Reddit Ed When I was in elementary school, my family had a Nintendo Entertainment System. We only had used games, most without a manual and never with their original box. Sometimes the label was even scratched off. As a result, there were a lot of mysterious games. Where in Time is Card in San Diego was pretty hard without the manual, let alone a grasp of things like geography, history, or English. This search for meaning could make them more interesting, though. Golgo 13, top secret episode, felt top secret. No one else at school had ever heard of it, or even had an idea of what Golgo was. My copy rarely worked. It was often just a flickering blue screen, but on occasion, the blue screen wouldn't flicker, there'd be bullet holes, and the game would start. The most mysterious cartridge was Taboo the Sixth Sense. It was made by Rare, the people who made Battletoads and some other games I played, but Taboo wasn't like those. It breaks the fourth wall immediately, referring to it as Taboo the Time Machine on Nintendo. It also asks for details like my name, birth date, state, and sex, and my question. Then it shows a bunch of medieval-looking characters, items, and locations. All this is shown as a bunch of cards, but there aren't any card-playing mechanics. It's more like it's drawing cards for you, but it never gets around to letting you use them. And after five minutes of playing, if you could call it playing, you're back at the start screen. Oh, but not before it shows you some lucky numbers. I think, was that the game over screen? There must be something more to that, right? I just need to figure out how to get past that part. Maybe this was just some sort of copy protection that expects me to have the manual to put in the right code. And because I rarely had that stuff, I was used to using brute force tactics to make any progress. I first thought that the lucky numbers could be a password. After all, it was kind of a game over screen, and you'd use passwords at game over screens to continue in other games, like Mega Man. But there wasn't a continue option in Taboo. Maybe I put the lucky numbers in for my birth date? That never seemed to change how it went, though. I was getting kind of desperate at this point, and thought maybe this was used in conjunction with the game genie we had? But then, the Game Genie only uses letters, and these are all numbers. Maybe the numbers correspond to the letters, and I have to put in the letters that go with those numbers? Uh, or, what if the different states are actually a cipher to use against the lucky number codes? What I didn't realize was that there was nothing behind Taboo's cryptic curtain. It was just a tarot card reader. The card game was just it doing a tarot reading. That's it. However, my older brother knew what tarot was, and that's what troubled him. He'd see me playing with the game for hours, and constantly writing nonsense in the notebook I used for game codes. One day, he took it out and smashed it with a hammer. That sort of reaction from my older brother at a cartridge spooked me, and instead of breaking the curse... It felt like I touched something truly occult. Faith, the Unholy Trinity is a set of three chapters developed over five years by Smith Mason under his moniker, Airdorf Games. It's a retro horror game set in 1987 in which you play as a priest trying to correct the botched exorcism of the child Amy Martin and contend with the horrific after effects. It's also my favorite game from 2022. Everything feels very thought out, and the short chapters, hidden notes, and multiple endings make the whole thing easy to replay, dissect, and marinate in. The game also reflects on the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s, in which there were non-stop claims from survivors of satanic ritualistic abuse being broadcast, fueled by pop culture depictions of the supernatural, and a fundamental misunderstanding of psychological conditions. 
These claims turned out to be fabrications time and time again, but the harm that satanic panic caused was very real, and faith doesn't shy away from that aspect either. At its core, though, faith is a reflection on profound doubt and how people respond to it. It's also the sort of masterpiece you get when you have a shorter game with worse graphics made by someone paid more to work less, and I'm not kidding. Everything is meticulously considered. It looks closest like games made for the Atari 2600, with its chunky 160 by 192 pixel resolution, its single color objects, and its black static screens. It's appropriate for a game set in 1987. But Faith isn't trying to hit the same notes as other throwback games. There are plenty of other indie games which match the look of older hardware and big game companies with retro sequels to their series which peaked ages ago. These capitalize on nostalgia and player expectations. Take Shovel Knight. It was pitched on Kickstarter as a love letter to 8-bits, and explicitly referred to Mega Man and Castlevania in its press release. Backers watching the trailer and playing the demo got a good idea of how this new blue platformer would move around, the sort of abilities you'd get by beating themed bosses, and what sort of fantasy castle areas it'd offer. It was selling the promise of a platforming experience comparable to the most familiar and fondly remembered of the NES library, a promise it made good on. But the Atari 2600 library doesn't have much to pull by way of iconic horror games for fate. There were some horror movie tie-in games, but the gameplay was derivative of other popular games. So a horror game like Faith doesn't have a point of reference, but that's fine. It's not looking to capitalize on nostalgia. And just when you think you know what to look out for, Faith subverts your expectations. We'll be back after this short break. From the twisted studio that brought you faith come four visions of horror so terrifying, so chilling, so free that you have to witness it yourself, if you dare. Airdorf's Double Double Feature Like hauntings, most indie games are so small they go unnoticed. Exploding goats, satanic rockers, ectoplasm. When a game is this charming, it is... Extraordinary. Airdor's Double Double Feature. A virtual pet. Like you had as a kid. Like you want to forget. You can hide the egg from your mother, but you can't stop the hatching. Airdor's Double Double Feature. Beyond the horizon of the organ trail is the monotony of the prairie. Washing the clothes. Checking on the neighbors. Watching after the family. Testing the gun. Life alone on the prairie is slow, but death comes quick in the wind. Airdorf's Double Double Feature When you need a helping hand, Earl is your man. But something's fishy about Earl today. Don't test the waters. Don't rock the boat. Don't dive in or you'll get hooked by Earl's Day Off. Airdorf's Double Double Feature And now, back to the show. By having a minimal presentation, Faith avoids the hang-ups of other adventure games. In an ornate point-and-click adventure game where every nook is lovingly crafted, the player is bound to miss what is interactable and start using their cursor like a metal detector. If you have to do that on a clock, hunting for the last clickable pixel goes from boring to frustrating. So, when you remove the inconsequential details, it's easy to identify what to do. What little you do see serves a function in the game. This is a cross, this is a key, this is an apple, and this is unsettling. So when you have to react quickly, you know what to do. You also have a consistent overhead perspective, like the early Zelda game. Care was put into getting the proportion of the rooms just right, the objects just coherent enough so you have a sense of the space everything occupies. With that consistency, you start to get a sense of the anticipation navigating the different screens. Going from the endless screens of the woods into the shed, you now only have one way out, and in order to get to the key, you have to go in deeper. Because every floor of the house has the same screen space, by the time you enter the basement, 
you also have a good idea of the route that you'll have to take to check out those spooky red sigils you see to the left. Looking at the sprites, you also start to notice something off. Like John Ward. Even though he's just a handful of pixels, John is immediately identifiable as a priest with his little clerical collar, but when he starts walking, he has an uneven posture and his head sways back and forth. He doesn't seem healthy. And when he does an exorcism, he holds up his cross, yet no matter where John is facing, why is the cross always facing us? For now, let's stick a nail in that. There are other things that don't add up with the game's consistent perspective. When you exercise an inanimate object, a note appears, but they're as big as doors, and that house key is bigger than John's head? Just about everything John has to aid him doesn't fit the game's established proportion. It's like they aren't tangible objects at all, unlike the threats. If you've seen Faith, you've seen its cutscenes. Disrupting the Atari 2600's conventions are these animated clips, often at a game over or at the start of a new checkpoint. Unlike the distant gameplay perspective, these put you behind John's eyes to witness fluid rotoscoped horrors, to get a greater sense of the terrors you're trying to exercise before throwing you back into the game. Although you don't get cutscenes of some of the more abstract and chaotic demon forces, you are shown enough to imagine it wouldn't be pleasant if it gets to you. Because the characters are all drawn in the same single color in the gameplay and the cutscenes, the quick change in perspective can be disorienting, but not confusing. The colors are also doing some subtle visual storytelling. See, characters and groups have their own distinct color. The graphics also signpost when a character or their influence is at play. John is blue, the Martin family is violet, and the demonic forces are red. By the time we finally see Amy Martin, it's clear she belongs with the Martin, but has been corrupted. And as the chapters go on, we see John become more stained with blood, making us question the purity of his heart. And then there's John Ward's cross again. Over the course of the three chapters, John Ward's cross itself changes from gold to silver to basically wood, but that doesn't strike the player as strange because it's just a symbol, and John's faith is wavering. The story of faith is presented in broken up, non-chronological chunks with details of the story fleshed out by the notes you find along the way, but the notes don't line up, and some of the events in different chapters outright contradict each other. Faith is a story of John Ward, a former priest who is fighting back demonic possessions. Or, Faith is a story of John Ward, a person who has had a break with reality, and whose exorcisms are hurting normal human beings like you or me. The gaps between the different chapters, the multiple endings of each chapter, five for chapter one, three for chapter two, three more for chapter three, the unreliable perspectives adds a lot of ambiguity for what actually happens in the game and what is real. If you see a definitive explanation for the game, it is likely missing the point and not appreciating that ambiguity for what it accomplishes. Leaving room in a story for multiple contradictory interpretations from start to finish is a challenge. Most spooky movies start off entertaining rationalization and a supernatural reading. Maybe a young child is possessed, or maybe the new parents are just operating under very little sleep. Maybe their new house is haunted, or maybe there's just a bad case of black mold or radon poisoning. After that mysterious start, though, there will be a lengthy section in which they put the strange occurrences through every scientific test they can think of, and more often than not, the rational reading won't have the answer. After all, people came to the theater to see something spooky, and who wants to see a movie about the horrors of Radon? This shift also fits the mold of Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. The characters start in a rational world, and journey into an unbelievable supernatural world. But by the end, there's a return to some semblance of the rational default. 
But that's not the only way a spooky story needs to play out. I like the other way better. Sometimes leaving room for doubt is the point. In Total Recall, it's not spelled out whether Douglas Quaid has actually gone on a wild adventure on Mars as a freedom fighter, or if he has fallen into a comatose dream. What is clear is that Quaid has become so immersed in it that he is not doubting it anymore, and the moviegoers may not question it either. Sometimes, that ambiguity clarifies what is actually important in the story. Let's Scare Jessica to Death is one of my favorite movies. Jessica, who was just released from a mental ward after a nervous breakdown, is settling down in an old house in the countryside with her friends. But the people around her start acting off. Her husband starts getting cozy with the strange woman they let stay with them, and the neighbors are hostile, and Jessica is starting to hear a voice in her head. Is she being haunted by a coven of vampires? Or are her loved ones just playing a really nasty trick on her at a time when she's vulnerable? Ultimately, it doesn't matter whether they're vampires or just regular assholes. Jessica is freeing herself of the people who are trying to take advantage of her. By not having a definitive answer, it trusts the viewers to find their own. Faith, the unholy trinity, is able to weave these two lines of interpretation throughout three successive stories, with each event and new piece informing how the rest of the story will go, maintaining its ambiguity and never providing a definitive answer the entire time. The supernatural angle is pretty easy to follow because it's John's perspective. Amy Martin was possessed by a demonic entity in 1986, a possession that he and his mentor, Father Alred, failed to exercise, resulting in the graphic deaths of Father Alred and Mr. and Mrs. Martin and getting John put into a mental institution from the sheer shock. After his recovery and release, John is still committed to save Amy from her possession, though. And although he fails at first, he eventually is able to push the demonic forces back with the help of Father Garcia, another priest who is also on a journey to purge our world of demonic influence. This interpretation of faith is very compelling because there's great global and personal stakes, and John is a very human character on a journey of redemption and healing. Even though he has been deeply scarred by the possessed Amy, he will nonetheless risk his death to save her. And through his struggles, he ultimately finds communities with other healers along the way. But what if there aren't any demons? In 1986, Amy Martin, an independent thinking teenager who helps out in an abortion clinic, is accused of demonic possession by her parents. Eventually, she's tied up in the basement to be exercised. What actually happened that night is uncertain, because the only testimony is from John Ward, who is committed to a mental ward, but escaped a year later. John who may no longer be a priest, and who may have never even been a priest. John, whose exorcisms may be fatal. I also really like this interpretation because it tempers the pop culture image of religious leaders finding and purging the demons from people with the ugliness of real-world religious violence. Even though this reading means that John is doing some very ugly stuff, it still has him as a tragic character, someone who is trying to save people, but who isn't safe for himself or others. You can still sympathize with him. Father Garcia is a different story, though. The thing chasing John in the woods in Chapter 1? Well, in Chapter 2, you find out that was Michael, another possessed child, who was strapped down to a bed for weeks and endured Father Garcia's exorcisms, which got pretty bloody. After all that abuse, maybe he can only get around like that on all fours. Maybe he recoils when John holds up that cross because of the trauma. So, 
if faith doesn't come down one way or another on if there are even demonic possessions, is anything coherent? Absolutely. You can come to your own conclusions about the demons, but there is no ambiguity about the plight of the houseless, those with HIV AIDS, or children by those with power. You may have never had a bad encounter with the cops in your playthrough, and maybe one will even help you out in Chapter 3. But if you make one wrong move, a whole squad may just fear for their lives and riddle you with bullets. And even if you only have positive experiences with the police, you know that they are able to commit great acts of inhumanity when you enter the candy cave and figure out how the man-eater has stayed so well fed. Even though an abortion clinic factors prominently as a place with a nefarious purpose, the type of place that is demonized in the real world, the thing that the game makes unsettling is that this clinic is denying reproductive rights and forces people to go through unwanted pregnancies. So, yeah, the game hits on very heavy themes, and towards the end of Chapter 3, at John's lowest point confronting Gary Miller, this happens. <laughs> Faith still knows when to pull its emotional punches, so it never gets so heavy that the game's miserable. It also feels self-aware that this is a game being scrutinized by every angle when John sees Father Garcia in Chapter 3, and Garcia says, I Father Garcia, it's good to finally meet you. You know, Father Garcia, the person John worked with in the finale of Chapter 2, who may or may not have even died then. Or was that a dream? And while we're at it, wasn't that Father Garcia hiding by the shed in Chapter 1? And he may have, have died there too? Was that a dream? Is this a dream? And when Faith seems like it'll indulge the player's silliest tricks, you may end up with some of the most emotionally resonant stuff. In Chapter 3, John is given instructions to check out different locations to investigate for demonic activity, but then John doesn't have to do that. You could just jump right back into your car and call it a day. Instead of getting some joke ending ridiculing you for not playing the game, Faith plays this scenario very straight and makes this route the most tragic yet. Whether the demons are real or not, John believes his soul is damned, and he is consigned to this fate. It's up to you to decide what part of the story is canon and what is apocrypha, what is real and what isn't, just as it is up to you to picture what the more abstract enemies actually look like. But those conclusions aren't formed just from what you witness, but rather from what you refuse to accept because faith is a journey in darkness, in search of the right path. And man, I really hope chapter 4 doesn't change this. <laughs> <laughs>